Madam President, I ask that the following statement be placed in a separate part of the record. No objection. Thank you, Madam President. Today, in Chicago, at Lurie Children's Hospital, one of our best, little one-year-old Caden Swan is in critical condition, clinging to life in the pediatric intensive care unit. Last week, at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday morning on Lakeshore Drive, one of the busiest thoroughfares in the city, one-year-old Caden was shot in the head while riding in the back seat of a car. He was an innocent victim hit in a road rage shooting. As we pray for Caden's recovery, as we express gratitude for the medical workers who are working around the clock to keep him alive, we have to ask ourselves a basic question. When it comes to this sickening gun violence that happens every day in our country, what are we gonna do? Give up or stand up? On March 23rd, I held a hearing in, the in our Judiciary Committee on gun violence. There was a mass shooting spree that killed eight people in Atlanta, Georgia on the day when I announced the hearing. Then there was a mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado that killed 10 people the night before the hearing. Others have followed. Since that hearing on March 23rd, according to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been at least 38 mass shootings in less than a month in America. Mass shooting is defined as an incident where at least four people were shot. This past weekend, and I'm sorry to say this is not an exception, 25 people were shot in the city of Chicago alone. Every day we lose 109 American lives to gun violence. Hundreds more are shot and wounded, carrying emotional scars for a lifetime. These victims are our neighbors, our friends, our family, and even a one-year-old baby like Caden Swan. I'm glad President Biden is stepping up to this issue and taking action. Last week, the President stood in the White House Rose Garden and called gun violence exactly what it is. It is a public health crisis. He's right. We need to take a public health approach to reduce violence that's killing so many of our fellow Americans. There is a playbook that works. We need to gather study and study the problem, data and study the problem, identify causes and risk factors, develop targeted prevention and intervention strategies that help bring the number of shootings down. We've stopped epidemics before. We're in the midst of doing one now. If we're willing to stand up and act, it works. President Biden took action last week and announced a set of common sense steps consistent with the Second Amendment and that actually will help reduce violence. He wants to reduce the proliferation of homemade ghost guns, which are untraceable and often undetectable. Regulate the use of stabilizing braces that can convert effectively pistols into sharp barreled rifles, like the weapon that was used by the gunman in Boulder. Put forth a model state extreme risk protection order law to help guide states that want to use these life-saving interventions. Restart the annual firearms trafficking report that tricks, patterns of illicit gun trafficking. And nominate an ATF veteran and gun safety expert, David Chipman, to give the ATF its first confirmed leader since 2015. I'm going to pay special attention to this nominee because it comes through the Senate Judiciary Committee. How many times have you heard it said, we don't need new laws, we just need to enforce the laws that are on the books? Well, one of the agencies that enforces these laws is Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division, ATF. What the gun lobby has done over the years to make sure the gun ATF didn't have any money or didn't have any leaders. We haven't had anyone in the post for six years with Senate confirmation at ATF. I want to change that if we can. At last, but certainly not least, the President announced billions of dollars for evidence-based community violence intervention programs through the American Jobs Program and other grant efforts. These are smart and targeted important proposals well within the bounds of the Constitution and the President's authority. I commend him for that action. But we shouldn't leave it to the President alone. We have a responsibility, too. We've got to make sure we close the loopholes in the gun background check system that make it too easy for criminals and those with mental instability to get guns. We've known it for years, but we haven't closed these gaps. The House has passed a universal background check legislation. 
Now the ball's in the Senate court. We need at least 10 Republicans if all Democrats will support it. I hope my Republican colleagues are willing to stand up and vote to close these gaps. There are other common sense changes we can make that deal with gun violence and community prevention. At a hearing I held on March 23rd, Dr. Selwyn Rogers of the University of Chicago Medicine pointed out that NIH has nearly $43 billion for medical research, only $12.5 million dedicated funding for research into reducing gun violence. We need to invest more into this research and CDC research too. We also need to support evidence-based community programs that show that they are effective in reducing violence. Saving lives from the horrors of gun violence should not be a partisan issue. It's absolutely heartbreaking to think about little Caden Swan sitting in the back seat of a car on Lakeshore Drive, which I look out from my place in Chicago and see every day and realize that he was shot in the head at the age of one and now is fighting to survive. The question is, what are we going to do with this challenge? With 40,000 gun violence deaths every year and more than 100 every day, give up or stand up? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do all I can to push common sense constitutional reforms to bring gun violence to an end in America. Madam President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum.